I recently bought several hundred pounds of grime and grease, and imagine my shock when I discovered that there was a lathe underneath it all. I have various pieces of it sitting around waiting to be cleaned. For the most part, it's all very complete. I don't think I'm missing much, and if there's anything missing, I'm pretty sure they'll be simple to replace. The bedways are covered in some grime, but for the most part, they seem pretty clean and undamaged, which is nice. That anchor stamp means this lathe was originally property of the U.S. Navy. I like how it's double-struck. I think that adds some character. It also amuses me to think that somebody just came in hungover that day. If you've seen my other videos, you might recognize this as the piece that tried to give me a hernia, then pull me down the stairs. Say hi, murder piece! I'm gonna take you along with me as I put this back together, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll share in the laughs, and I'll do all the crying for both of us. The first step to getting the lathe back together is cleaning off the pedestal and refurbishing this pulley a bit. I've got some light rust on the outside of this uh, three-step pulley cone, so I'm going to knock that off now. I know I make it look so effortless, but I am definitely going to have to find a way to put a motor on that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to make it cleaning these that way. Check out how good this fit is. You're not going to believe it. <laughs> I think I just used up all my good luck for the year. All right, we're starting with a full battery. Let's see where we get. Oh my gosh, it's scary. <laughs> It's making scarier noises now. Oh my gosh. Push through the terror. It was definitely wise of me to not put a screw through that. That was just a press fit, which, uh, <laughs> came unpressed very quickly. <laughs> Look at that! Some of that was unnecessary, but most of it was fun. I spun this back up off camera, and, uh, well, you can see. Damn. This is not a, uh, endorsement for Milwaukee, but, uh, I'm pretty impressed by that. Ball's in your court, Blue. I added a, uh, makeshift counterbalance to keep it hanging level. My pride saw me setting up that pulley system and said boo, but my spine was cheering. A basic wipe down has got this thing pretty clean so far. Is nice to see. If you're thinking about buying a used lathe, let me show you a quick tip to see how that lathe might have been used during its life. Look for this part on the bed. Chips and gunk do not magically float up against gravity and get stuck in here. If you find chips up here, it's not magic. It was compressed air. Compressed air is generally considered a no-no for the health of your machine. Yes, it does get the chips off. Yes, I absolutely do it at work. But those chips will often find their way into places that you did not want them. There's other spots to look, but this is definitely the easiest one to see without taking it apart. And if you find it nice and clean in here, that's a good sign. I can tell from here that this thing is dying to twist on me the second I lift it. So I've got my anti-bump-into-the-wall protocols already in place. I knew it was going to do that from when I was taking it apart. It was able to uh, stand up on its own after I took the legs out from this side, which I thought was amazing. I hope I don't sound like a broken record, but it goes without saying that that thing is heavy.
<sighs> There's nothing quite like that feeling when the bolt finally catches. That was more trouble than I thought it was going to be. Look how far I pulled this thing off the mark. This is a pretty cool turning point to see where the lathe is starting to look like a lathe. In a desperate attempt to shed weight off of this piece when I was loading it, I took off one of these and then stopped myself when I started to take off the other one thinking like, look, if these aren't going to make the difference, I got no chance. They weigh about maybe half a pound. I guess I'll never know if they made the difference. Now I've got to get them back on and connect them to the chip tray. I think I'll have to crack loose the bolts that I just tightened on the legs to make it happen. Or maybe their engineers did a fantastic job and I'll be able to put this right on without uh, having to do any of that. Let's see. A cool design feature I found on these is that they have these three embosses that form a raised surface. These three points describe a plane to keep this nice and tight onto whatever it's clamped to. And the height of this top emboss is just slightly above center line of these two bolt holes so it's going to get forced into whatever substrate it's bolted to. That's pretty cool. I think I'll steal that and use it in my own designs. I swear this scratch was not my doing. These embosses are now making a lot of sense to me. I was saying earlier that they're for clamping to a flat plane and they could probably do that but this is not a flat plane. This is a curved surface and to get a good purchase on it, they need those contact points. That is very, very clever. I sure hope ratcheting is as interesting as I think it is. Probably isn't though. This is the first washer I found on the whole machine, by the way. Let's see if she fits. <laughs> nope. Oh, look how much it's off by too. Uh, I guess I'm loosening those other bolts. Age old wisdom that rings true is to avoid tightening all your bolts until you've got them all in, even if it messes with the flow of your filming. 9 16 socket. That same 3 8 thread. 9 16 nut? No. 11 16 Damn, non-standardized fasteners. Maybe ratcheting is as interesting as I thought it was when something's going wrong. Ugh, whatever. This is the motor that I got with the lathe, not necessarily the original motor that came with the lathe. This is the wire I found coming out of it. Not often used for 115 volt service. That right there says this is a 115 volt motor. What I'm positive happened is that the original motor died and whoever put this motor in, whoever found this motor and put it in said, that's some perfectly good wire. I'm not gonna throw it out. So here I am. But let's get this case off and take a look before I rush to judgment. Maybe something's going on in there that I don't know about. What the fuck? Huh. All right. Well, I think it goes without saying that this sort of behavior is a no-no. Did that just fall into the motor? I just very carefully examined the footage I just took, and I saw it in fact did not fall into the motor. It's hiding right here under this red wire. It could still totally fall in there, though. Oh, God. Oh, relax. Oh, my God. I just started those threads off camera because I lose all motor skills when recording, apparently. Okay, glad that's over. That's how it's supposed to be. After doing some testing with this old piece of wire, I've decided that the motor is good and I'm gonna go ahead with it. I've got a fresh piece of wire that's a bit longer. The guy at Home Depot was too lazy to use the measuring spool when they sell it by the foot, so he just pulled it between his arms a couple times and said, that's about eight feet. I measured it, it's more like nine. Got terminals back on these ends, and I left the ground terminal a bit long, so if there was some bizarre event where this thing got pulled out of the motor, the last thing to be pulled out would be the ground wire. That's never going to happen, but it still feels good to do it. This is a good opportunity to explain the use of these wires. 
So the ground goes to one location, the hot goes to another location, ideally far away from the ground, and these two remaining wires will alternate turns being used in conjunction with the hot. This is a dual speed motor, so this orientation has high speed, this orientation has low speed, and this orientation has light motor on fire capabilities. Truth be told, I'm not positive what would happen if you actually did that, but I'm not ready to find out. Seeing four conductors inside this wire is what made me think this was a mismatched wire at first. Now that I know this is a two speed motor, it makes perfect sense. But for most of the common AC motors that you plug into the wall, this is what you're going to see when you wire them up. And that's my excuse for being wrong earlier. This is the armature that bolts onto the back of the lathe and eventually holds a switch. What we have is a hot wire that has gone up from the motor cable and back down through the arm. A white lead and a red lead from the motor cable. They don't look like it, but, well, actually... There, that's a bit more convincing. These leads were coming off of the motor, and this white lead was the neutral from the wall. So what we had there was low speed, high speed. And this green wire, I'm not going to call it a ground because that's not what it was doing. <laughs> Hard to call it the ground accurately when it was bonded to the hot. When I wired up, it's going to be the ground. I'm going to physically secure this green wire. Not important how I do it, just going to make sure it doesn't go anywhere when I start ripping out the other wires. I actually wound up pulling it from the other side I thought I was going to pull it from. He said, not successfully pulling it. Little did I realize those wires were not going to come out the direction I thought they would, so I've changed gears to having this black wire be the one I've secured. Here's the end of that black wire, and here's the other end that I tied in. That way, when I was pulling stuff out this way, it wouldn't get sucked in and become unreachable from this side. This is my way of threading new wire, or at least some tool to pull wire. It's now time to get this motor, which is not lightweight, up onto this mounting plate. I'm realizing my planning here is not quite perfect. Probably should have put that motor back on when I could still flip this thing on its side. But I'm not going to stop doing something just because it's the wrong thing to do. I'm going to keep on doing it until it's the right thing to do. This is actually going easier than I thought it would. This does not make for compelling drama. Maybe I spoke too soon. Oh, fuck. Ugh. Turns out moving your entire body so you can see it is quite worth it. All right, that's good. The struggle of taking this lathe apart is what inspired me to go out and get these uh, ratcheting wrenches. They are just garbage from Harbor Freight, but I will take the right tool from Harbor Freight over the wrong tool from Snap-on any day of the week. The belt that I found with this motor is your very common V-belt. This is the right pulley for it. This one, on the other hand, is completely flat and does not feel like it has a crown. Something tells me this might not be original. When I found the lathe, it had chips on it. That tells me that at some point in time, it was running. I don't know if it was necessarily running with this motor and setup. Maybe those chips were old. Take it from me, this thing was covered in lots of chips and stuff. But, uh, you know, here's to the power of wishful thinking. Wow, it actually works pretty good. Cool. I have the cover that goes over this opening, but I have something of a problem with it. Maybe someday when I have access to a sandblaster or I've got some more motivation, I'll restore it. As for right now, I'm just going to run the lathe with it not in place and OSHA can go fuck. Hopefully, if any of you are not convinced, I have the restraint to not stick my hand into that belt. I thought it'd be kind of funny to clean these pins up using the lathe that this new lathe is going to replace. <laughs> I know shots like this are not the most exciting 
thing in the world. But I swear, if there is even one guy in a cabin in Iceland somewhere who finds them entertaining, I'm gonna keep doing them. Here's to you, Bjorn. This is a fun moment because now I get to put one of these uh, cool looking machine doors back on. That's what these pins are for, if that abrupt edit earlier did not make any sense. Just ignore that. I'm ready to put this other grate on. I think this is probably the coolest looking one on the machine. I don't know if this is original or not, but how I found this was with just a bolt and no washer. This might sound odd, but I'm a huge fan of that. I can't explain why, but I hate washers. Also, the head of this screw is completely painted over. No strong feelings on that, just a comment. I believe all flathead screws belong in the garbage anyway. This is definitely a job for a socket, but I think this is funnier. The headstock is in really good shape. I think all it needs is some light disassembly and cleaning. The back gears come in and out nice and smooth. There's a little bit of rust here, but that's easy to get rid of. These gears are used to change the direction of the input into the gearbox. The headstock has a gear coming off of the end that will engage with one of these based on what position this tumbler is in. Very glad these are nice and smooth. Of all the details on this lathe, I think this one is my favorite. This little uh, squeeze handle that pulls this pin out so you can move it to the various positions. I just think it's really neat. I feel like a lot of this segment is going to be me saying, ooh, that's cool, and uh, how this cover goes on is no exception. This little set screw here has a sharp point that goes into a divot there, and this one tightens into a corresponding divot, and they did a really clever job there sparing themselves having to align a drilled hole through here. Pretty clever South Bend engineers. Two pieces of advice if you're trying to undo a nut that's attached to a gear. Jam something in the gear train that is soft, like this shop towel. And if you experience a lot of force while trying to loosen the nut, stop. This one wasn't too bad. I want to have clear access to wipe down this face. So it is now with extreme caution I will take apart this journal bearing assembly again. There is something to expect in this one. That shim right there, do not lose that. Okay, plan B, that's not going anywhere. I'll work around it. Employee of the month right here. This cleaned up really nice. I like how it's looking. I had a lot of fun getting up close and personal with all these mechanical items. It's a really cool window into history, looking at this stuff. These parts are over 80 years old and they still work great. I have one last cleaning chore that's kind of interesting. These standoffs that look like shoulder bolts held some idler gears. They could use a quick polish, but they spo they're supposed to have a smooth running slip fit with these gears. I already cleaned this one out. As you can see, there's an oil port there that goes down into this chamber that then gives oil to the inside of the gear. When I found it, there was this hard substance that was stuck in there. It's really solid, and it resists the tweezers when I go to pick at it. I'm not positive if it's uh, an old oil wick, or it's just oil that has solidified over the years. Either way, it's gotta come out, and I'll figure out what to do with it later. This is a hardened piece of steel. This is a very low quality, crappy drill bit, which would absolutely not leave a scratch, even if I missed and hit the edge. Very rare reason to use a low quality drill bit. Nasty. Yeah, that has some tensile strength. That's definitely a piece of oil wick that has degraded over the years. I'm gonna put it back together now, lightly, so I won't lose the pieces, but I'm gonna order some of this and make sure I replace it. These gears are not the same size, so I will be able to tell for sure which way they go. Let's see if I can guess right on the first shot. Uh, I think you're the little one. Huh, nope, guess wrong. Wait a minute. That one's not supposed to mesh. No, I was right. Should not have doubted myself. That's the lesson here, don't doubt yourself. Even if you have some critical machine parts, just jam them together until they fit. Doubting is for quitters. Finger tight that for now. Just to be clear, this is not the gear oil I'm gonna use. This oil is just to coat these parts when I assemble them. That way, if in another 80 years, somebody wants, hopefully not me, somebody wants to take this thing apart, there's a lower chance of this being full of rust.
for a split second, I didn't know how to clock this thing. I realized there's a key. It's like a, I failed an IQ test for a monkey. Resist the urge to hit it with a hammer. Don't do it. This is the first convenient thing I found. Let's try this. Good enough. Nice. Make sure to get these mating faces as clean as you can before you put them back together. I don't know how well the audio just came across, but that was a satisfying click sound. Little shout out to my uh, great grandson if you're taking this thing apart. The reason why you did not have to get that off with a hammer is because I put some oil underneath it. And you're welcome. And also, your great grandmother, whoo! The headstock is held in place by a V groove that registers with the bed. It has cleats on both sides that hold it back and forth, and a dowel pin to help hold it as well. There are two screw clamps that force it down onto the bed and make it register with all those features. Removing those screw clamps was something of an ordeal that I've been thinking about how to tell the story of for a while, but uh, uh, here's a good way to start. This one on the back was pretty easy to get to. I'm gonna leave that finger tight until I get the other one in. This absolute bastard, on the other hand, this clamp is coming in from the right side of the frame because I had to slide it in from the full, <laughs> from the end of the bed. Oh, what are you getting stuck on now? Okay, apparently I need to let the bolt fall out. Then maybe I can slide it. Trying to get this bolt into place, I completely understand why they used to hire children to thread looms. Little hands can reach in here where how I cannot. Yes, I am. I am officially supporting Industrial Revolution era child labor. What are you gonna do about it? Oh my gosh, I think I need to take the whole headstock off and, and redo this with a different approach. Oh, these bastards continue to, to vex me. Ugh, alrighty, plan B it is. If there's somebody who worked at the factory and uh, did this for a living, please like me up in the comments. Or if this is how they actually did it, that'd be hilarious. No matter what, this feels like a low man on the totem pole kind of job. Oh, come on, you absolute fucker. Okay, plan C. What's going up on what, and what's going to try and break my finger when it falls? Okay, I try really hard not to criticize other engineers. This, this deal right here, suboptimal. I just went and reinstalled the one on the back. Took me about eight seconds, which is heartbreaking. I brought my standard toolbox when I went to take this thing apart, and that included a wrench that was about that long <laughs> when I started. While I was trying to take off this clamp, I found that there was absolutely no combination of wrench placement that could get any purchase at all. Like a caveman, I even reached in there with some of these and all that did was damage the head of the fastener if I was even able to grab it. So eventually the only course of action was to cut this wrench in half. But my issue was I did not bring an angle grinder. The house I was taking it out of once belonged to a uh, welder fabricator guy. Tools of his were still in his garage. The homeowner was really nice and also really wanted this lathe out of her basement. So she was happy to let me use some of those tools. When I got to the garage, I found a bench grinder like this. And I had it in my head that I was going to very laboriously and slowly whittle this away until I was able to just take it in half and then I'd knock down the edges. Two things knocked that plan out of gear. One is that when I turn the grinder on, it's, uh, well, let me simulate what happened. And two, it wouldn't have made much difference anyway because it, I'm pretty sure by the smell, it was sitting in a pool of gasoline. <laughs> So grinder was disqualified. I thought I was done for until I noticed that uh, he actually had an angle grinder, much like this, except not like this at all. I've got a four and a half inch cutoff wheel on here. His grinder, on the other hand, had a wheel whose thickness was approximately that of my wrench and whose diameter was more like this. I also had access to a welding bench and one of these vice grips pliers, and it was at least this tenuous. I did not bring safety glasses to this job, so all I had were safety squints. I held the angle grinder like this, and I fully extended my body as far away as I could. And when I pulled the trigger on that angle grinder, it about threw itself out of my hands, dug into the wrench, and threw a rooster tail of sparks about eight feet long into a pile of sawdust and dry tinder and gas cans. <laughs> All in all, it was a very humbling 30 seconds. <laughs> Sounds like something we've all experienced. I'm not ashamed to admit that it was pretty terrifying. Pretty soon I had two pieces of wrench 
And once the ends stopped being uh, molten, I went and found a belt sander and I cleaned off all the burrs and nasty. I promise that before I left, I made sure that the spot that I flamethrowered sparks into did not have anything going on. When I was done packing up what I could for that day, I also took another trip out to the garage to make sure. And I came out the next day to finish the job and the garage was still standing. Not the wisest move I've ever done in my life, but probably top 100 funniest, at least in my opinion. I've got the spindle back into its journal bearings. These are impressively smooth and precise. I'm going to start reassembling this side of the spindle bearing. This shaft collar that controls the end play of the spindle is moved back so I got some room to work with. The felt wipers that sit in these grooves have been soaking in some alcohol. Nothing fancy, just some smeared off. Just some isopropyl alcohol. Did not seem to do very much though. I'm not too worried about it. These are pretty easy to access if they need to be replaced. This is kind of a cool moment. Hopefully it goes well without any notable hiccups. So well so far, which uh, just makes me suspicious. It turns, but it makes a little bit of a scary noise. Oh. Okay, it seems to be over it. Still pretty good. All right. Inside this spindle housing, I found these shims, but they are made of paper. So right off the bat, my confidence is pretty low in those. This has not been improved by the fact that I have definitely dropped this one a couple times, and I'm not sure where it went back. I'm going to wing it and see what we get. Come on, go in there. Piece of shit. These started off white when they were first put into the machine 80 years ago. So much uh, for what the rubbing alcohol did. Probably because it's the wrong thing to use. Oh, what's the right thing to use? Probably just new pieces. Those paper shims are not ideal, but they seem to be working okay for now. I've got some mixed feelings about this chuck. It seems to be rusted up pretty good. It's probably stuck pretty hard on this spindle. What I do like is this. All things considered, I think this makes it worth the effort. There's lots of ways to get a stuck chuck off of the spindle. You shouldn't do most of them, but let me start with some of the least injurious ones. I've got a short piece of uh, Dillagaff cord here. It looks like paracord, but I assure you it's much, much stronger. I'm going to use it to try to arrest the shaft from rotating. That's good and tight. And as I rotate this way, it's just going to get tighter. That might work. I think the funniest moment in TV history is when Hank Hill is trying to get his regular size can of WD-40 open. So he pulls out a small can of WD-40 from a holster, squirts it onto the can's lid, and then pops it free. I don't have any hex stock or else I'd be using that. And then give it a try with your handy dandy bolt rounder. Okay, she's on there good. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. I like to tell myself that this helps. I won't lie to you. I managed to break this free off camera, but I'll do a dramatic reenactment for you. Okay, ready? Oh, wow, it's free. If I had to guess what actually broke it free, though, I think it would be all the other methods failing, <laughs> so the WD-40 would have more time to work. Ugh. Split washers. Split washers are stupid. This is what I'm trying to do to get that back plate off of there. It's kind of difficult to explain, so I won't. Tally ho. It's getting stuck, but I think I'm going to refuse to learn my lesson and persevere. Cannot believe I got away with that. <laughs> it's, it's still stuck in there. Thank you, spare piece of Delrin. I promise I will make you into something cool. Oh, thank goodness. I just discovered that this is loose. The second I saw these bolts, I thought I had another uh, hammer and pry fest on my hands. I shake it. I bet it's pinned in on these, and these are pinned in with this. I never thought I'd be happy to see a flathead screw. I still wish it was a hex, but I'll take what I can get. 
Yep, that confirms my theory. Gotta take out all these gears first. Screwdriver's a little too fat. Let's grab it there. Hmm. I actually don't think I own a flathead that's narrow enough to do this. Now I do own a flathead that is narrow enough to do this. Oh, that's cool. It was blue in there. Man, what an amazing piece of engineering this gear is. I've laid the pieces of the chuck out on some towels in a rather transparent attempt to appear organized. I need to get these threads completely clean. After that, I think it's pretty much ready to put back together. This is graphite lubricant. It came out of the can looking like spray paint and scared the living hell out of me. Boy oh boy am I making a huge mess. Most of the fasteners on this lathe are flathead screws, so it's pretty nice to find a socket cap screw on here. Taking the apron off of the saddle is going to do a world of good when it comes to lifting this thing. The taper attachment is also some low hanging fruit for weight reduction. It comes off with one bolt here. Or so I thought. Looks like there's a gib I can loosen here. Maybe that'll free it. That did it. I gave the apron a good cleaning off camera. I am very pleasantly surprised to find that there are no mechanical problems with this thing, at least that I can find. Just to keep it interesting, I'll show you some cool features on here. Most of the gear train is lubricated by a single oiler. Oil is added here and fills this reservoir. These oil wicks transmit the oil to the various gears that need them. The half nut is also oiled in an interesting way. Oil comes in through this port, fills this little basin here where it goes off down this hole and this hole here that you can't see. And then it waterfalls down and fills these two ports. This one goes directly onto the lead screw. Not quite sure where that one goes. Putting the apron back on has a chance to get exciting. I say that because there's a solid chance I'm going to drop it. When heavy meets the demand for coordination is when all hell can break loose. Ah, what am I doing? Come on, simple tool use, like the primate you are. Oh boy. I hate turning threads and not knowing if they're going to catch or not. But when the threads do catch, oh, that's cause for celebration. The gearbox is much easier to work on when you take this thing off. And I hate using adjustable wrenches, but I don't keep giant sized wrenches around all the time. That zip tie costs three cents. Losing that keyway costs quite a bit more. I don't know if you can see it, but there's paint on this long gear and it makes me want to slap somebody. Come on, who makes a hex cap that thin? Ow. I'm just going to keep squirting WD-40 on it, give it some time, and hopefully I don't have to hit it with a hammer like an idiot. I'm going to be very careful not to let it go into mesh with uh, this gear here. Do not want to smack those together, but I will smack it back and forth a little bit. Alright, it's getting looser. Hey, it's a miracle. Gears are so cool. I think I figured out what this gearbox's problem was. This, this is the proper location for this gear to be in. It had degrees of freedom that let it go like this. In the past, this lathe was allowed to run like that for some time. You can see the points of this nut are actually damaged by the gear teeth. Additionally, this transfer gear was able to run too far to the left, and there was a clash between gear teeth right here that should not have been allowed. When this gear slides over to the right, one of its positions is meant to mesh with this middle gear, and the damage on these teeth 
prevent it from running smoothly with this one. What I have to do is clean up the edges of these teeth, clean up the edges of these teeth, and control the placement of this gear, and everything should be fine. A quick touch up on the edges of these gear teeth with that Dremel, and they're running like new. Except for that. Excuse me a minute. Okay, that's better. Now I need to take out the freedom from this area. I can't have this gear sliding backwards anymore. I just whipped up this piece on my other lathe. And... I swear I did... Ugh, dude. I swear, this that was not staged. Oh, come on. I'm gonna snap fit this onto this section of shaft, and that will prevent this gear from sliding backwards. Let me just push this out of the way for a second. Here's a sample of shaft that's the same diameter, and here's what's gonna happen. Here's a helper tool to push that on there. I guess that technically works, but I totally missed, and I jammed it up in the corner. I mean... No, no, I can't leave it like that. Ugh, come on, you can be lazy or you can be stupid. You gotta pick one, dude. I put a flat on the back of that, and I cut this flat, so that'll help me control it when I go to push it. I am calling that a success. Not looking forward to ever taking that off if I need to, though. It's time to clean up the lead screw now. A method that some people use is to take a string and let it run through the flanks of the threads while it's on their lathe under power. I would only recommend that method if you're very tired of having ten fingers. I've got the lead screw set up in my lathe here, and it's, uh... <laughs> kind of funny that my lathe can hold the whole thing. I have a special method of doing this that makes it much safer than spinning it under power. I've disengaged this drive lug. The spindle now rotates essentially free of these pulleys. The only thing driving the shaft is the frictional forces between the shaft and the pulleys. A setup like that is not likely to endanger my ability to count to 10, so I'm going to proceed. That worked out pretty good. It's nice and clean now. I did not realize that there was another lathe in the background of the shot. There was actually a casualty while doing this. But funny enough, the lathe was off, and it was a knuckle buster I got while I was wire brushing this part of the screw, and my hand slipped off and bashed into the dovetail of my tool post. Pointy little bastard. Now, if you absolutely must clean your lead screw and you have to leave it on the machine under power, my advice, if you absolutely have to do it, is don't. The lead screw is held in place with these two jam nuts. Here's my normal thickness 7 8 wrench. Now, I'm not proud of this, but I'm doing it anyway. Yes, I am ashamed. No, I am not going to go out and buy a thin 7 8 wrench just for doing this. Caveman method worked just fine. Getting these gearboxes back on by yourself can be kind of difficult. You have to be very careful not to bend this lead screw while holding this gearbox out in space, threading the lead screw through the worm gear on the carriage, making sure that you get the keyway in the right position, and then sliding it over to the headstock, holding it in place, and putting in these screws to hold it up. To make the job easier, I built a lift system that will help me out. I've had the idea for this system in my head for quite some time now, and I've never found a good reason to use it. This is not a good reason, but I think it's about as close as I'm going to get. And I'm just really curious to see how it's going to work, so I made it for fun. Here's a diagram of the system I'm using. The pulley on this orange rope lets the system move left-right, the red rope is able to slide through these pulleys and leave the work at a constant height or to move with this degree of freedom in opposition to the counterweight. The workload could be anything. Here I'm representing it as five imperial standard bananas. The counterweight has a times two mechanical advantage. So I use a counterweight that's slightly more than half of the workload. That extra weight helps overcome friction. The overall effect is an assistance system that lets you move in the XY plane as shown here. And if you tune in the ratio of the workload to the counterweight, the friction in the pulleys will hold the workload still if you release it.
I'm holding that up with one finger. I can even readjust the camera with my free hand. Okay, I take back everything I said about not needing this system. That was incredibly easy, and I would set this up again in a heartbeat if I had to do that a second time. It feels very strange, almost wrong, to modify any of these original parts. There's no denying that lots of things about machines built from years past are much better than what we have today. But uh, electrical safety is not one of those ways. Hey Dave, why'd your house burn down? Oh, I felt this bizarre, misplaced desire to keep every single part of my lathe original. So I left on these old wire clamps that eventually vibrated free and started an electrical fire. Well, where do you think that misplaced desire came from? <sighs> well, if we're going to unpack it, it's probably from the... Uh... Oh boy, am I uncomfortable right now kneeling on the floor. Had to cut that shorter. So here's what's gonna happen here. Hot from the wall, hot to the motor, hot to an accessory cable. I'll bond all these together. Neutral from the wall, neutral to the accessory cable. I'll bond those together. All the grounds get bonded together. And then I'll have another leg of the wall neutral going up the arm to the switch box where it will travel with these two leads from the motor for high speed and low speed. I might send a leg of ground up the arm too just because that's a very convenient spot to ground the machine. Not quite sure yet, I'll see what I do. So here's the brave wires that are going up the arm now. I do have a switch that's a bit more original to this machine, but it's in a condition that I don't really trust, so I'm going to use these as a temporary measure. This is a basic on-off switch. It has a jumper that connects it to this three-way switch. In the up position, power is going to go to this lug. In the down position, power is going to go to this lug. And that's going to be my high and low speed selection. <sighs> I cannot believe that I got all the way through wiring and explaining these before I realized that I forgot to put the wires through the electrical box that I have. I made this little bushing here to keep the sharp edges off the wires. I'm using this plastic mounting plate to hold that box temporarily. This will electrically insulate the box from the arm, so I'll need to have some kind of jumper that connects them for the ground. I think that'll serve me pretty well until I uh, find some authentic switch in the future. I know this part here looks a little unusual, but at least it does this now. That sort of functionality will reduce your chances of dying from electrocution thereby allowing you to find other means to shuffle off this mortal coil. I've got my accessory power cord wired up to a plug, and my main power cord is wired on as well. This is a pretty cool moment. I'm ready to plug it in and try it out. I'm just kidding. My lights are not on the same circuit as any of the outlets in my shop. Although I am kind of ashamed to say that this is the first shop I've ever had where the lights were properly wired onto a separate circuit. One of the things I had to replace on this lathe was the original belt. I found this one online. The original was quarter inch thick leather. This one is a modern material. 
It's also not quite as wide, but it looks like it'll do a good job. This is the place I got it from. I gotta say, I really like their business card. Yes! This is the lead screw that controlled the crossfeed on the lathe. It has quite a bit of backlash. This screw was unusable, so I had a new one made. I found this guy on eBay. He did a really good job. It was easy working with him. I appreciate his hard work. Nowhere near as much backlash there. When I was looking at this nut here, I noticed something very interesting. The pilot hole for these threads breaks right through and exposes the lead screw. Now that is not a mistake, because this bolt that goes into those threads is hollow for some mysterious reason. And if you look at the top, you can see that there's a set screw in there. It's an oil port. Little stuff like that is so cool. The guys who designed this must have had a chalkboard in the office with the word oil circled three times and underlined. If I start to reinstall anything and I notice that it's backwards or wrong, I promise I won't edit it out and make it look like I'm smarter than I am. Might be redundant to oil these threads, but why not? I need some greater degrees of freedom to push this screw backwards in this direction. And instead of taking off this part of the taper attachment, I think I'm just going to drive out this taper pin. Note to self, I put that on the table behind me where I can lose it more easily. Oh, is that cool? I'm glad I took this thing apart to have a look at it. I wonder if these were reamed in assembly so the taper of this hole matches the taper of this hole. It looks like it goes back together no-brainer right now, but who knows if I'm going to wind up taking this off for some dumb reason. I'm going to put a timing mark on here. There. There's no getting that wrong. I think it's fair to dock me half a point of doing something wrong for that one. Oh, wait. Nah, make it a full point. My plan was to slide this on here like that, and then screw the thread into this nut. I think you see why that's not going to work. Ugh, I gotta stop bumping the camera. I'm gonna give you guys motion sickness. This piece has a keyway that references with a corresponding keyway on the end of that lead screw. Well, I just realized that this needed to go in first. Okay, right in the middle of fixing that mistake, I realized I was making another mistake and I can actually just drop the apron down a little bit and I'll provide some clearance for that part to slide through the front. I'm still gonna dock myself all the points that I lost uh, backtracking like this, but I gotta have a special category for points I lost doing the wrong thing while I was doing the wrong thing. Whatever. I actually want to cinch the apron back up a little bit so I can clear the gear teeth, but sort of feel where they need to be. Nice, I can see they're meshed in there. For the record, I want to note that I did have the forethought to loosen these bolts. That way when I dropped the apron down, this lead screw had a degree of freedom to move. Paying attention to this part of the carriage reminded me of this scratch here. This scratch was not my doing, and also the original screw here was a flathead. I think somebody was having a bad day back then. <laughs> I'm glad this thing is mounted on dowels. This zero was absolutely etched in assembly. These two pieces must be mated together. I bet it'd be a bitch to replace, but I gotta admit that's pretty awesome. This ring here is biased to stay closed, so I have to pry it open with the screwdriver to get it on there, after which it's pretty easy to move. This piece is pretty clever. It has a steel set screw, but inside it has a brass plug so it doesn't mar up the shaft. That's how you avoid losing a machine key. I just got down on the level of this keyway. I realized it's not a keyway at all. It's a drilled hole, and this is not the original key at all. I cut a short piece off the end of a cheap eighth inch drill bit instead. Ah, 
That's pretty cool to see. There's not very much to say about this tailstock. It's in pretty good shape. It just needs to be cleaned. You know, I, I feel like I deserve that. I mean, I don't have it open yet. I might take off this thing and find that it's cracked in half in there, but until then... This concludes the segment regarding the tailstock. The taper attachment is going on next. This thing is really cool and gave me quite the surprise when I realized it was actually two pieces. Huh. I was unaware that it did that. What in the hell? All right. Guess I'm you now cleaning twice as many. Could probably edit together a full minute of me struggling with threads. I hate to add a washer to an otherwise respectable machine, but socket cap screws have quite a bit less bearing surface than hex caps. Here's the taper attachment in action. As I move the carriage this way, this tapered dovetail is going to push the cross slide this way. And by that, I mean it's actually going to drag the thing along the bed because I didn't tighten this enough. Okay, here's the taper attachment in action. Kind of hard to see and not very exciting. Here, I'll tilt this more extreme than you'd normally see. Hopefully that kind of shows it. Now that I've shown you how it works, I've got this unclamped and hanging off there. I'm going to use this taper attachment probably once every three years. And when I'm ready to do that, I'll put this back on. Reassembling the compound slide is a job that'll go easier at the bench. How the hell did this go back together? I don't think it's even remotely possible for me to keep playing that, keep track of when I put something together wrong. Lots of this stuff happens off camera. <laughs> Dude, come on. Why won't you fit? Is this? Oh, thank God, it's right hand thread. Kind of odd when the threads get worryingly loose like that. Oiler for the screw. Indicator for that dial. Nice and bent to hell. Also sort of stripped out. Ah, good enough for now. The compound slide is held in this hole via these little hardened pegs, and these are pushed in with some jack screws. This is not just a flat plane they've ground on the end. This is actually a concave radius. Just gotta use the power of mental thinking real quick to know which way to orient that. What you do is just press them below the face there. There's two of them. Very careful to keep that orientation from rotating. Now, do not just add your jack screws. Reach into that hole with a poke tool of some sort and press those inward. That way they seat against the base of the compound and any rotation from this screw is not gonna get them out of alignment. It's starting to look like a lathe, and sound like a lathe, and rip your arm off like a I'm getting pretty close to done here, and I'm fairly excited about it. I just got done hitting as many of the lube points that I could find. I'm using a non-detergent SAE 10 weight oil, and I'm using it for everything. Only the spindle bearings should receive SAE 10, and everything else should get SAE 20. I'm just going to use the 10 weight oil for everything. That way I don't have to keep a bunch of oils in organized cans. And if there are any uh, South Bend purists out there, I hereby invite you to come to my house and fight me on my front lawn. If you're having a hard time sourcing 10 weight oil, go to your local auto parts store and ask for non-detergent 
10W20, 10W30, either of those oils will work. The 10 in 10W whatever refers to the viscosity at room temperature, and the other number refers to the viscosity at an engine's operating temperature. And I don't know how you use a lathe, I'm not here to judge, but when I use a lathe, it is usually not at the temperature of an engine. Although this lathe stood a good chance of finding itself at the temperature of an electrical fire had I left it wired the way I found it. It's taken a lot of work to get to this point. To be fair, I did do a lot of it wrong, but it's still pretty substantial. There's going to be lots of improvements over time, tooling I'm going to buy, fixes I'm going to continue working on. Right now, there's only a couple more things I want to show, and then I'm going to start making some chips. I have this leftover piece of guarding, and I, for the life of me, cannot figure out where it goes. Oh, it goes right there. I was going to make a montage of looking around for spaces that this fits, but it actually does go right there. Is there a special word for being so stupid that you roll back around to smart? Well, I feel much safer with that in place, I guess. I didn't get a hold of this lathe with a tool post or the T-nut that goes in here. I fabricated one that'll do the job, and I designed it to work with this uh, tool post that I had. This tool post has officially been reassigned, and uh, its old partner is not taking the news very well. I woke up cold and out of touch The photos and the memories will never be enough As you can see here, it's not a very high quality tool post. Someday I'll probably stumble across a better one and outfit this machine with it. Till then, this one's plenty good. These chuck jaws are also pretty damaged on their face. I don't know what kind of maniac did these to them, but uh, as they are currently, I'm probably not going to get a good grip on anything using this face. So I have a solution for that. I have about 20% confidence in this idea, but that's better than zero. If this is looking like a bad idea to you, then c congratulations on your common sense, I guess. I know that looks pretty janky, but I'm fresh out of a giant stack of washers to fit in there. You know, it looks pretty silly, but uh, I'll be honest with you, it's actually pretty rigid. Quick safety tip, if you are worried about a grinding wheel exploding, go like this and listen for that ping sound. If you hear a dull thud, it means that there's a crack in the wheel, usually somewhere where you can't see, and a wheel that doesn't ring like this is liable to explode on you. Ideally, I would have some peg of hardened tool steel that sits stationary in space here, and the grinding wheel can move past it in an axis that is parallel to the bed, and I would dress this face here so it'll track perfectly over these. I feel like for what I'm doing, if I get pretty close and then I take some conservatively light cuts, these will begin to match and then I'll have a much better angle to start dressing off of. Before I start grinding, I'm going to clamp the jaws down on this piece of urethane. That's going to make sure that their teeth are engaging with the scroll inside all in a similar way to each other. I've taken some measures to catch some of the sparks that are going to come off of this. It's not overly sophisticated, but I think it'll do the job. That's actually looking pretty promising so far. I'm oh, surprised I'm getting away with this. So the grind is not absolutely perfect, but I did get much better engagement across all the teeth that are still long enough to engage with the work. I'll replace these jaws someday, but I think this will hold me over for a while. <laughs> Man, I really should not have gotten away with that. Well, I suppose it's time to make something now. It's kind of funny that I just got done touching up these faces of the jaws, and now I'm about to do this. Dude, what? Oh, come on. Just small enough to not fit on those. There we go. That'll do it. So, I'll be honest with you. I don't really have a plan. I'm just gonna make some chips and have some fun.
transition sequence. <laughs>